you want to talk about being at the pinnacle in life and society in general, it doesn't get too much higher than leading Ohio State, a college football team, to a national championship undefeated season as a true freshman running back. But unfortunately for Mr. Maurice here, things came crashing down in the summer of 2003, the offseason heading into a sophomore season. And nobody knows to this day where Maurice was heading towards or what he was going to do, but he winds up making a U-turn in a place where you can't make a U-turn and the police, they turn their lights on. And this is where Maurice compounds a bad decision with another bad decision. He tries to outrun the police and next thing you know, he finds himself in a police chase. This is Tom McDaniels, high school football coach in the state of Ohio in the late 90s and early 2000s. He pushed every single one of his players to their limit on a day in and day out basis. But he had one player, a running back to be more specific here, that was so talented he knew he was going to have to push him harder than everybody else. But here's the kicker with that. It didn't matter how hard he pushed him, that guy wanted more. And he even stated he wanted to be better than the best. This is the said running back we're talking about and the main subject of today's video, Maurice Claret. We're going to talk all about him, don't worry about that. But going back to his high school coach here, McDaniel stated that he was more of a household name than LeBron James in the state of Ohio. And whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. I know what I'm sitting here saying, Matt, come on, man. You're trying to tell me that Maurice Claret was more of a household name than LeBron James, and yes I am. The reason for this is fairly simple. In Northeastern Ohio, football was bigger than basketball, and Maurice Claret, he was the biggest thing in football. A reporter went to watch one of his games and stated, quote unquote, he has transcended sports and he is a cultural icon. Now this, what you're looking at right here, is a very young Jim Tressel. That name should ring a bell for a lot of you, and ironically enough, he was coming onto the scene right when Maurice was as well. He was the head coach of Youngstown State. Why is that important? Because for those of you who don't know, Youngstown State is located in Northeastern Ohio, and that is where Maurice Claret grew up. And due to all of Jim Tressel's success at Youngstown State, Ohio State, they hired him as their new head coach, and coincidentally enough, that was right when Maurice, he was heading into his college career. And this may shock a lot of people, but originally Maurice Claret wasn't too interested in going to Ohio State. He had his options narrowed down to Notre Dame and Miami. But when Jim Tressel got the head coaching job at Ohio State, this changed everything because Maurice felt like he could relate to him. This was a guy in Jim Tressel who was around the Youngstown area and he knew how bad it was at the time. And that is why Maurice and Jim Tressel, they bonded from the start and it even got to the point where Jim Tressel, whether he wanted it to be this way or not, he was essentially a father figure for Maurice. Therefore, this led to them getting the nickname of the Youngstown Boys. But although Tressel was bringing in this insane and ridiculous five-star running back, there were still naysayers and people that weren't buying into the hype of this kid. Heading into the season of 2001, it was looking like Maurice, as a true freshman, was going to win the starting running back job, and that was unheard of back then. And there was a ton of people questioning, like, man, is Jim Tressel going to do this? I can't believe he's going to start a true freshman. Why would he even think about doing it? And right before the season started, Jim Tressel announced that Maurice Claret, as a true freshman, was going to be the starting running back at THE Ohio State. This caused a huge, and I mean a huge storm, and here's all Tressel had to say about it. Seniority is only important when there's a tie. With Maurice Claret, there was no tie. He was the best. These words really stood out to me because it goes to prove how unreal this running back was. His head coach stated, compared to everybody else on the Ohio State roster, he was at a different level of intensity, nastiness, and competitiveness. And guess what? Starting him as a true freshman, it paid off big time. He went on to have a ridiculous season, to say the least, and also has currently one of the biggest plays in national championship history, won the national championship, and carried that Ohio State team. And his greatest things we're looking for this young man. He was one of the best freshmen in the country. He proved all the naysayers wrong. One of the best players in general in the entire college football world. Things, they went downhill, and I mean they went downhill fast. What if I were to tell you this same guy, bigger than LeBron in high school, five-star recruit, every college wanted him. He goes on to start as a true freshman and dominates as a freshman, carries Ohio State in the national championship as a freshman, never played another snap of football in his life. I'm not just talking about college football, I mean at any level, he never played another snap again. What would you say to that? I'm going to assume you're probably saying something along the lines of what went wrong and what happened. Well, the short answer to that question is this right here. 
a lot happened. There was a lot of shady stuff going on, but Ohio State, and more importantly, the athletic director turned on Maurice, and they pretty much just screwed this guy over. And according to one source, quote-unquote, Ohio State went after Maurice with a vengeance. And there's many people out here that have openly stated the athletic director definitely had something against Maurice. And you want to know what saddens me the most about all of this? Maurice Claret was a really good guy, and he didn't cause any problems. I know what some of you may be thinking, oh, he was doing terrible things off the field. Nope, wasn't doing any of that. Ohio State went after one of their own players for something I'm going to label as minuscule and mundane. And what made all this even worse is, since he couldn't play football, he got extremely depressed, and I understand it. And since he was depressed and he didn't know what to do, this led to him turning to drugs like most people do in that situation. And that got so bad that his girlfriend stated he was living a double life. And I know everything I've said up until this point, it's been a lot, but ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're just at the very tip of this iceberg. There's so many layers to this story and so many questions people have been asked about this guy even till this day. But however, it all circles back to the one. And I mean the one big question we're going to try to get to the bottom of in today's video. What really happened to Maurice Claret? Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, hope all of you are having a great and fantastic day. If not, hope this video can make it a little bit better. And I can't tell you enough how excited I am to get into this Maurice Claret video. I have spent days doing research, gathering information on it, and I'll just tell you right now a little teaser. You're in for a treat with this one. And I gotta say one more thing and we're gonna get a move on. Similar to the Marcus Dupree video, I did pay to watch a two-hour documentary on Maurice Claret just so I could gain some more information and knowledge on his situation and story. I'm not gonna lie, your boy Matt is a very frugal and stingy person and I didn't want to cough up the couple of bucks for it, but anything for research purposes and for your guys' entertainment. The reason I share that with you, though, is because I want you to understand, I watched the Youngstown Boys documentary. It's an ESPN 30 for 30. That's what I'm referring to. I'll be using a lot of information from that 30 for 30 because it's so good, and it just gives you the insight perspective on everything that went down. In other terms here, the video you're about to watch, this is the knockoff version of the 30 for 30. Of course, I'm going to put my own spin on things, and we're going to talk about some other things they didn't even talk about and go into more detail, but I just wanted to get that out there right now. Because on the Marcus Dupree video, I saw a bunch of you commenting, yo, Matt, your video is great, and I appreciate those kind of words, but you should check out the Marcus Dupree 30 for 30. And I guess it's my bad for not clarifying it in the Marcus Dupree video, but leading up to it, the documentary I told you guys I paid to watch in that said video, it was the 30 for 30 from ESPN, the best that never was. And I'm so glad you guys have been recommending some of these older names that really scratch the back part of your brain for a lot of people because I think these stories, they're way better than some of the newer ones we do. And when I say the newer ones, I'm talking about when we talk about guys that have quote unquote disappeared from the 2010s, 2015, 2020, and so on. These stories dating back to 20 plus years ago, they had me captivated way more, and I guess it's due to the fact it's almost like an unsolved mystery. Because with the guys that fall off and just go down a wrong life path from 2015 on, we kind of know what happened to them because it's in the social media era, and people have talked about it before. But with guys like Marcus Dupree, I'm going to continue to go back to that, and Maurice Claret, back then, when they fell off and disappeared, there was no social media. I just like these older story videos so much more, and if you have any recommendations on some stories dating back to... 20, 30 plus years ago you think are worthy of a video, feel free to leave a comment down below and who knows, we might make that video. I jibber jabber enough though, strap in, buckle up, get your snack, get your popcorn, it's gonna be a good video set at least, but alright, blah, 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 shut the crap up, now that for that do. let's get into it. Woo, man, oh man, we got good old Maurice Claret, and come on man, you already know to get into his story, we gotta throw it all the way back where things started. Mr. Maurice Claret played his high school football for Warren G. Harding High School, which is located in the state of Ohio. And at this high school, this is where, according to his head coach, McDaniels, he dominated. And one of the funniest things I saw is his brother stated, man, sometimes I was showing up late to the games, it'd be the end of the first quarter, and it was already 28 nothing, and he had four touchdowns. Now, as to why his own brother was showing up late to his games, that's a different conversation for a different day, but I think that just goes to prove how dominant him and his high school team was. And one thing that really stood out to me about Maurice is when everybody was talking about him, they didn't just rave about how big, strong, and fast he was. They always talked. Every single person brought up his intelligence. And don't get me wrong, Maurice wasn't lacking in the fast twitch abilities, strength, size, speed, etc. But what made him so special was how he could see a gap and hit it immediately. His vision separated him from everybody else. And I believe 
He was destined to play running back. A lot of times kids growing up, they want to play running back or quarterback just because they want to. It's not actually the position they need to be at, but for Maurice, he was a true running back. By the time his senior year rolls around, he is listed as a five-star recruit with a 98 overall scout grading in every college in the country, like I said, they wanted him. Originally, the two schools that piqued his interest was one Miami, and that one's obvious because back in the day, they were dominating, and the other one was Notre Dame. And most people at the time thought he was going to go to Miami. It was set in stone, but out of the woodworks, here comes good old Jim Tressel. And Jim Tressel was one half of what we know as today, the Youngstown Boys. And the reason Maurice gravitated towards Jim Tressel, it wasn't some complicated reason, it's because there was relatability there. And I gotta give you some context behind Jim Tressel and what made Maurice like him so much. When Tressel was at Youngstown State, he made it a point that he wasn't going to go out to all these other states in America and get all these other players. He wanted to prove that he could win college football games with guys from Youngstown. And what was so impressive about Tressel is he did just that. His team was 70-80% Youngstown boys and they was winning all these games. So could you really blame Maurice for wanting to play for him? It was a perfect storm. Maurice is a top recruit. He wants to play for a big time school. And then out of nowhere, Jim Tressel, he gets hired at Ohio State. As soon as he gets on a campus at Ohio State from day one, he's turning heads. But one important thing to note, and this just goes to show you how determined he was, he graduated high school early so he could join Ohio State in the spring semester before his true freshman season. And I don't think people talk about enough how dedicated Claret was to the game of football. A lot of times when you see it, especially kids nowadays, they're infatuated with the benefits from being a star football player. The girls nowadays, NIL, so the money, cars, fame, notoriety, etc., etc. But Maurice Claret just loved football. And more importantly, I think he fell in love with the process of becoming a better person and bettering his character in real life every single day. Because at the end of the day, that's all this thing we call life is. It's a video game. You're trying to level up. And for Maurice, he most certainly was leveling up. And in his practices at first, he'd break off one big run and everybody's like, all right, you know, he's got a little something to him. And then he'd break off two big runs in a practice, then three, four, then so on, so on. It got to the point where the coaching staff was like, well, dang, we have no choice. We can't keep this guy off the field. And it's a tricky situation to handle because we're not even talking about a redshirt freshman. A true freshman, to a certain extent here, you want to humble the guy and show him that, hey, you got to work your way to be the starting running back. But that was a predicament Jim Tressel and the coaching staff was in, and it was a good predicament. He was working hard, if not harder, than everybody else. And multiple teammates from that Ohio State team stated that he raised their level of play, and Maurice, as a freshman, motivated them to work harder. In Maurice's first start against Texas Tech, in his first two opening drives, he didn't do much of anything. Comes off the field after that second drive, and this is when Tressel walks over to him and says, hey, you got one more drive, and if you don't do anything, I'm going to put in some of these other guys and see what they can do. On the next drive, it's 31. Ohio State's up 7 nothing with five minutes and some change to go in the first quarter, and this is when arguably one of the biggest plays in Maurice's career happened. They hand the ball off, Maurice makes a couple of moves, and yeah, the rest is history. He's in the end zone. And why I label that as one of the biggest plays in his career is because from then on out, he was the starter. He won the job on that play. And think about it. If he were to lose a couple yards on that play or have zero gain and Ohio State has to punt, Jim Tressel was going to put in the backup running back. Not to say that Maurice wouldn't have got another opportunity that season, but the point is he locked in that starting job and he erased all question marks. Because now the naysayers couldn't point to anything and say, oh, well, you're starting this freshman and he's not producing. No, he was producing. And when it was all said and done for his first game, he had 175 yards and three touchdowns. I'm going to say it again and beat it into your heads. A true freshman. He left zero, and I mean absolutely zero room for doubt. He was the guy, and he proved it. And it wasn't just the breakaway runs that stood out. It was his five, six, seven-yard runs. He could turn a one-yard gain, what's supposed to be a one-yard gain at that, into a seven-yard gain. That's what made him so special. And after that game against Texas Tech, he dominated the rest of the season. He, quite frankly, looked like a pro-level running back playing against boys out there. And the ironic part about that is he was the boy. He was the young man. But here is the what I'm going to label as weird part for Maurice. He was a flat-out superstar at Ohio State, but he didn't like attention. According to his friends and family, when he got done with his football games, he always did the same two things. He would go back to his house where his mom would give him a foot rub massage, whatever you want to call it, 
And he just liked hanging out with his friends, but he never wanted to talk about football. He always made the conversation about his friends. He always asked them how's school going, how's class going, work, et cetera, et cetera. And one story I thought was really cool, and it goes to show you the type of person that Maurice is, is one of his buddies he grew up with, he became a teacher. And this teacher that was a friend of Maurice's growing up, all of his friends would tell him, oh, you'll never be able to get Maurice to talk to your students. He's too Hollywood now. He's too big of a big shot. And guess what? Maurice would talk to the students every single opportunity he had. And Jim Tressel stated that Maurice would often come to him and talk about how he wanted to help others and do more things in life than just play football. We'll talk more about that later in this video, so stay tuned for that. Fast forward time a little bit, Ohio State, in Maurice's freshman year, they're undefeated and they're heading to a national championship where they gotta play guess who? Big and bad Miami. Heading into this game, nobody, and I mean absolutely nobody, that Ohio State was gonna beat Miami. And you look up in this ball game, it's early in the third quarter. Ohio State's already at one touchdown in their drive and about to get another. But this is when Ohio State's quarterback makes a terrible decision and he throws an interception and it looks like immediately the momentum switched just like that. But during the return of the interception, Maurice stripped the ball of the guy who picked him off and Ohio State got the ball right back. And that play by Maurice doesn't get talked about enough. That wasn't just one of the best plays in that game. That is one of the best plays in college football history. If he doesn't take away that ball from Miami, who knows what would have happened. And oh yeah, by the way, that led to Ohio State getting three points, which was very key and vital in this ball game because the game did go to overtime. And for those of you who didn't watch this game, and it even pisses me off thinking about it and when I was re-watching this game for this video, that's the game where Miami, they got straight up hosed. I'm not a Miami fan by any stretch of the imagination, but good gosh almighty, that pass interference in overtime, that's blasphemy. That is ridiculous. I'm not here to debate about that too much, regardless of how I feel about that. It's not even questionable. It's the most ridiculous and terrible pass interference call I've ever seen in my life. Ohio State, they win the championship. And you want to take a wild guess at who scored the game winning touchdown in double overtime? You know who I'm about to say next. Maurice Claret. He was a legend at an all-time high, and some people go as far as saying he was the next best thing since sliced bread. You want to talk about being at the pinnacle in life and society in general, it doesn't get too much higher than leading Ohio State, a college football team, to a national championship undefeated season as a true freshman running back. But unfortunately for Mr. Maurice here, things came crashing down in the summer of 2003, the offseason heading into a sophomore season. In the summer of 2003, this is where the NCAA, they opened an investigation on Maurice Claret and it caught everybody by surprise because, like I said, he's a good guy, never got in any trouble off the field whatsoever, not even to the slightest of bits. Well, come to find out after the national championship game, Maurice's car, it broke down and this is when he called coach Jim Tressel. This is where Tressel proceeds to tell him, hey, go see this guy, he'll hook you up. And let me clarify this, this wasn't something that was shady and Jim Tressel was like, no, don't tell anybody about it. No, that wasn't going on. He just told him, hey, go see this guy, he'll get you a car. Maurice goes to see the guy, he lets him borrow a car for a couple of days, and while Maurice is borrowing that car, somebody breaks into it. And when someone breaks into the car, Maurice does like anybody else would do. He files a campus police report. But this right here is what triggered the NCAA, because then they started asking questions. Well, number one, Maurice, how did you get this car and where did you get it from? Because this was a pretty nice car at the time and the NCAA also questioned because in the police report it states he had $800 in cash. Well, how did you get this $800? Which to me is kind of ludicrous because he can't have $800, his mom couldn't give it to him. Hey, I don't know, it just seems kind of fishy because I know what the NCAA is trying to say. Oh, this is an extremely poor kid. Somebody had to give him the $800. We know, so let's not act dumb here. The NCAA does even more digging and come to find out, somebody was also gifting him a cell phone and paying for it. And from all the information I dug up, here's my conclusion and this is my humble opinion, I personally feel like the NCAA, they were targeting him. They had meetings every single day trying to find out any sliver of information about Maurice Claret and some of these quote unquote improper benefits he was receiving. It wasn't like the NCAA just happened to find out about it and there was a whistleblower, no. They were actively going after him, trying to find out information. And the only thing they ever found out was, yeah, people around Ohio State, they were giving them some gifts and they were giving them some money. And when I say some money, I know that's a vague statement, so let me clarify even more. We're only talking about a couple thousand dollars. I know the rules are the rules, I get that, but to me, I feel like in some cases and scenarios, you gotta turn the blind eye. I mean, seriously, dude, come on, man. What are we talking about here? A couple thousand dollars? This guy probably generated at least $10 million for the university. 
I would understand it a little bit more, and I'd be more calm about it if he received twenty five thousand dollars. I'd be like, okay, that's kind of crazy. But a couple thousand, two or three thousand dollars, get out of here. And the phone he was given allegedly was used just so he could call his mom back home. I'm sure he used it for other things, but that was the main purpose of it. But the NCAA, no, 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 we can't have that. No, 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 that's crazy. And what drives me crazy about all this is you got all these other problems going on. You got real criminals out here, and you're going after Maurice Claret because somebody gifted him a couple of stuff. You know, they gave him a phone, let him borrow a car for a couple of days. They gave him a couple thousand dollars. And this is why I like the NIL, because I am sick and tired of these institutions profiting off of these young men and not giving them a single pen. It's not even that. It's the fact that if they do something like Maurice did, they're suspended and their life is ruined or their livelihood's ruined. As far as it goes for these kids in the NIL getting a couple million dollars per year to play at Ohio State, that's crazy. And it's a different conversation for a different day because having that much money at that young age, it can be looked at as a bad thing, and I get that. But here's the thing with Maurice. It's not like he was really trying to profit off of his name, even in lightness. He just needed a freaking car so he could go to the gym, and he needed a phone so he could call his freaking mother. The NCAA in Ohio State was trying to portray it like he was living some bougie lifestyle, when in reality, he was just gifted the bare necessities that most people already have access to. To go on top of things, we got to listen there. On December 21st of 2002, one of Maurice's buddies who he grew up with in Youngstown, he was killed. And yeah, I know that was kind of a brutal intro to that but that's pretty much all there is to it the point is he passed away and maurice like any decent friend out here whatsoever he wanted to go to his buddy's funeral but here's a problem with all of that ohio state's gearing up to play in the national championship but for maurice to leave ohio state and go to his buddy's funeral he would have to file some paperwork so ohio state could pay for that but according to the athletic director who's a dirtbag and i'm just gonna come out and say it he's a dirtbag in my humble opinion he stated that Maurice didn't file the paperwork. Well, here's my thing, buddy. Why don't you help him out? He's your star player. Why don't you help him out and reach out to him and say, hey, let's file this paperwork so we can get you out there. You see, the problem is, and the athletic director doesn't want this information out there, but your boy Matt doesn't care, Maurice was already talking to the administrators about leaving, and they kept giving him the runaround, like, oh, we'll get you out there next day or the next day or next day. Athletic director Andy Geiger, he was a straight-up liar. He stated Maurice didn't file the paperwork. Come to find out, he had the paperwork, but he never ran it through. It just laid in his office. Maurice stated himself the reason he believes that Andy Geiger didn't allow him or to pay for his flight, whatever you want to call it, is because they didn't want a drug-related death to be talked about before Ohio State's matchup with Miami. And what's crazy about all this and what caused this huge controversy, which we're about to get into, is Maurice stated this publicly in interviews before the championship game. So in our terms here, he pretty much just attacked Andy Geiger personally, and yeah, he didn't like that. This right here is Maurice's attorney, and he stated that when Maurice came out and stated that, oh, Andy Geiger was lying about helping me trying to get out to my buddy's funeral, that's when Andy Geiger, yet again, athletic director for Ohio State, he turned on Maurice, and he started attacking him. He also stated, quote-unquote, Andy Geiger wanted to break Maurice Claret, and he had animosity towards him. Because Geiger had this mentality of, and I'm calling it little man syndrome, who is Maurice Claret to call out the university, more importantly, call out me, the athletic director. He's a nobody. He's just a player. This guy you're looking at right here, and yeah, I'm pissed off about it because I'm passionate about it. The athletic director for Ohio State, Andy Geiger, is single-handedly the main reason and cause for Maurice Claret's downfall. But here's where the controversy starts to build up. When Maurice and Andy Geiger here, they were going back and forth with one another. This is before the championship game with Miami. Remember, like I just told you a couple minutes ago, the NCAA, they didn't open up their investigation on Maurice until the summer of 2003. So although Andy Geiger had animosity towards Maurice, he couldn't do anything about it. But when the NCAA opened up their investigation, that is when Andy Geiger, he went full throttle on him. Fast forward time a little bit to August 11, 2003, so right before Maurice's sophomore season, him, his attorney, and Jim Brown, they meet with Andy Geiger because they want to try to get this resolved. Now you may be wondering, Matt, why is Jim Brown involved in all this? And that's because Jim Brown was a respected guy around the Ohio State area, and he felt like if he brought him along with him, he could persuade Andy Geiger to just lay off him a little bit. And Maurice's attorney, who you see right here, proposed to Andy Geiger, hey, Let's just do a one or maybe two, three-game suspension, and let's put this behind us. 
But Andy Geiger didn't want that. He wanted to ruin Maurice. In which, <laughs> and I quote, Jim Brown states, or he actually stands up and looks at Andy Geiger and states, this is B, we'll just say BS, family-friendly channel here. I hope that puts into perspective of how ridiculous this was. Jim Brown stood up and said, this is bull crap. It's almost ridiculous that Andy Geiger wouldn't cooperate. And it originally started out that Maurice is going to be suspended for the first three games, and three turned into six, and six turned into eight, eight turned into ten, and next thing you know, you look up, he didn't play the entire season. I think y'all can tell from the tone of my voice. I can't tell you enough how sad I am for Maurice Claret that this happened and how pissed off I am that he had to go through all this. They were treating this man like he was some mastermind criminal and all he did was accept a couple thousand dollars, borrowed a car and a cell phone. Get out of here! And to put the cherry on top of things, after he misses that entire season, Andy Giger comes out and states, oh well, we may allow him to come back under some stipulations and some punishments. Andy Giger stated if Maurice wanted to come back to Ohio State, he would have to do punishment runs, maintain a 3.5 GPA with no tutor, he can't eat with the team, can't work out with the team, and he has to meet a psychiatrist. Buddy, I'm going to say this calm and nicely. I'm not going to scream. I'm not going to scream. What are we doing? I understand the 3.5, but without a tutor, what's the point of that? And then this is what really pisses me off and it irks me. He can't eat with the team, can't work out with the team, punishment runs, has to meet with a psychiatrist. They're treating this guy like he's some vigilante. I'm telling you, nobody got screwed over more in the history of the sport of college football more than Maurice Claret. Ohio State blatantly screwed him over. They tried to ruin him. And it got to the point where Ohio State tried to make him feel like he was an outsider and he wasn't a part of the team. It was quite obvious, and you didn't have to be a rocket scientist to figure out that Ohio State, they weren't going to allow Maurice Collier to come back under any circumstances. This then put him in a very tough decision because, remember, when he had that breakout freshman year, he was a true freshman, and to go to the NFL, he had to wait. To go to the NFL at that time, you had to be removed from high school for three years, and it's only been a year for him. Or actually two years, my apologies, because he played that one year, then he sat out. So he winds up suing the NFL to petition that he can be eligible for the 2004 NFL draft. And originally, he won the case trial, but it got reversed in the Second Circuit. That whole situation can be kind of confusing to some people, so I'll dumb it down here. He tried to enter the NFL draft in 2004, they turned him down, so he had to wait until 2005. And here's where things take a drastic turn in our story. After the court overruled the original hearing that he was going to be able to enter the NFL early... He just had to sit down a year, and he had nothing to do. All he had was time on his hands. This then led to him entering a deep and dark depression because he was looking at guys like LeBron James, who he grew up with, thriving and succeeding in their career, and here he is. He can't even play his sport anymore. Maurice started partying, and he was partying hard, and he was drinking alcohol every single day and a bunch of it. But he was still able to fight through that, and believe it or not, he was still in tip-top shape, and probably not the best shape he'd be in, considering if he would have stayed at Ohio State, but he was still looking great. He moved down to California, where he found himself a mentor, and he was training, getting ready for the NFL Draft Combine. And here's what shocked me. He didn't play football for years. He shows up to the 2005 NFL Draft Combine, and he shows up lighter than what he was at Ohio State. His measurables looked great, killed the interviewing process, and he did the bench press 23 times. And then what everybody was waiting for, the 40-yard dash, it was up next. And this is what put a nail in the coffin for his hopes of getting selected in the first or second round. His 40-yard dash was a 4.72, and one scout even stated, quote-unquote, it's almost like he ran in slow motion. He looked terrible out there, man. He was dropping passes left and right, and some people even stated in some articles I looked at, it was one of the worst combine performances in history. Me, personally, I think that's pushing it a little bit too far, but here's one thing for sure. It wasn't good. But here's the thing about that combine performance. At the time, that's what everybody expected him to do. It wasn't shocking that he didn't perform great. The guy didn't play football for a couple of years. Of course he's not going to look like what he did at Ohio State in that unreal season he had. I don't care who you are. You don't play any sport for three years, you're not going to look like you did three years ago when you was playing it all the time. His combine performance was so bad, a matter of fact, most people thought he was going to go undrafted, and if anything, best case in scenario, he's going to get selected in the 6th or 7th round. But on draft day, finally, Maurice, he caught a break. 
in the 2005 NFL Draft, he got selected in the third round with the 101 overall pick by the Denver Broncos. That right there was just huge news at the top because like I said, most people thought he was going to go undrafted. Denver took a chance on him and of course hindsight's 2020, but back then it kind of made a little bit of sense. You got to think about it. The last time we had any game footage or video footage of Maurice Claret to the slice of bits, he was dominating the game. He was at the tippy of the top in sports. Sure, he didn't play for a couple years, but you could argue and say that's good for him because his body, it's going to be fresh. And the upside to selecting him in the third round is, hey, this guy, he looked like he had first round talent when he was at Ohio State. And of course the downside is, well, there is some red flags and you don't know if it's going to work out. But regardless of all the question marks from Denver, they take them. But here's where things get even more interesting. Him and his agent at the time, they were betting on themselves. They turned down the signing bonus and proposed to deal with the Broncos. If Maurice Claret goes off, has back-to-back thousand-yard rushing seasons, he can get up to seven or eight million dollars per year. So Maurice didn't even get the signing bonus. He got zero dollars up front. And I'm going to say this yet again, hindsight's 2020, but back then, if it had worked out, we'd have been talking about how great of a move this was and how great of a decision it was. But obviously, you know where I'm about to go with this. It didn't work out in his favor. Maurice showed up to camp 20 pounds overweight and he was battling alcoholism. It was to the point where he couldn't even function. And Maurice stated when he was with the Broncos, quote unquote, this is where things got wicked and crazy and I gave up. Mentally, I didn't even know who I was. But here was the one thing that I took notice of. He stated, I lost my edge. Because remember, all throughout his life, I felt like that was the one thing he had, and it's the one thing that made him so much better than everybody else, his edge. Growing up, the odds were never in his favor. He used that as fuel and motivation. Gets to Ohio State, who's this guy? True freshman starting? There's no way it's going to work out. He just used that as his edge. But with Ohio State doing him the way he did and the situation turning out the way it did, he just lost his hope, he lost his hunger, and he lost his passion. With all that being said, only one month after signing his contract with the Broncos, they cut him. And you gotta remember too, the reason they were so quick to cut him is because they weren't giving him any money, so they wasn't losing anything by it. Whereas, if he'd have took the signing bonus, they might have had a little bit more of an incentive to keep him around. But since he had this crazy incentive of a contract where he needs a thousand rushing yards and they'll pay him seven, eight million dollars, and they knew he wasn't even gonna see the playing field, yeah. They were quick to cut him and release him, whatever word you want to throw in there. After the Broncos cut him, no other NFL team showed any interest in him whatsoever, and that was the end. He didn't just not play a snap in the NFL. He never even played a snap in the preseason of the NFL. When you look back at it, it's surreal at how fast his career crumbled. Four years ago, star freshman at Ohio State. Now, he can't even get an opportunity in the NFL and nobody wants him. And this is also a big thing to take into account. He had no degree to fall back on. I'm not too sure if it would have mattered whatsoever, but to Maurice, he knew that and he wasn't dumb, so he had to turn to something that he didn't ever think he'd have to turn to, and that's selling drugs. Let me rephrase that. He didn't have to do that. He chose to do that. And while he's selling drugs and he's involved in the street life, he stated, quote unquote, and this is where things get sad, I remember asking people for jobs who were asking me for autographs only a couple years prior, and they turned me down. You want to talk about life humbling you, that's the definition of getting humbled. People that used to ask Maurice for autographs were now being asked by Maurice, hey, can I have a job? And they were telling him no. That is most certainly the definition of a full circle moment. And it didn't take Maurice long to find himself in some trouble because he wound up robbing two people at gunpoint. Shortly after that, in August of 2006, Maurice, he loaded up his car with a bunch of guns and he decided to go on a drive. One key piece of information to throw in there is Maurice was currently facing up to 30 years in prison. He was currently out on bond because of robbing those two people at gunpoint. And nobody knows to this day where Maurice was heading towards or what he was going to do, but he winds up making a U-turn in a place where you can't make a U-turn and the police, they turn their lights on. And this is where Maurice compounds a bad decision with another bad decision. He tries to outrun the police, and next thing you know, he finds himself in a police chase. And the reason he tried to outrun the police, I get it, it's because he knew, dang, I got all these guns in my car, and I'm already facing 30 years. If they catch me now, it's over. Well, like always, I don't know why anybody tries to run from the police. Eventually, they're going to catch you, whether it's a hour, day, 10 days, or 100 days. 
they catch him. And when they catch Maurice, they see all the guns in the car, but also he's wearing a bulletproof vest. Now let's just say he wasn't too cooperative with the police because he was spitting at him. And since he was spitting at him, and you hate to see this happen to any human, but it had to be done, they put a cloth over his mouth. <sighs> Man, just looking at this picture, it's, I don't even want to look at it, but you see it. I hate to see that, I do. I firmly believe Maurice wasn't a bad guy, he just made a couple of bad decisions. And hearing his mother talk about it almost put me in tears because she stated when I saw him, they had him muzzled up like an animal. And I really like what Maurice had to say in an interview and you can tell just by listening to him in the ESPN 30 for 30, he is an intellectual and smart guy. He stated that he was angry at his life and how things turned out. And he also stated and gosh, it just hits home with me, I wanted to go down a better path, I just didn't know how to get there. It's a shame, man, it really is, and I have a ton of sympathy for him because you could feel it. With Jim Tressel in Ohio State, he looked at Tressel as that father figure, as a guy that could lead him in that right direction. And when Ohio State turned their backs on him, he didn't know what to do. It felt like the world was against him, and I get that. Granted, I'm not excusing his behavior just because Ohio State did him dirty. That doesn't make it right for him to do what he did. But when Ohio State turned their backs on him, it was such a pivotal moment in his life because it led to everything else. Since he couldn't play football anymore, it led to depression. Then depression led to him consuming alcohol and then the rest is history. And it got so bad he started popping pain pills, Xanax, and any type of drug out there, you name it, he probably did it. And when it was all said and done, he was sentenced to seven and a half years in jail. But here's where our story takes another drastic turn, but this time, for the better. You see, Maurice Claret entering prison, going to jail, that might have been one of the best things that ever happened to him. And this is one of those examples of the system actually doing its job and turning out in somebody's favor. When he went to jail, he decided he wanted to turn his life around and he had a bunch of time to think back and reflect on all of his bad decisions and where he went wrong. And it goes back to something I've said all throughout this video. He was extremely smart. When he was in prison, he was studying philosophy and psychology. And the way he went about his prison sentence, it was very business-esque. It was almost like the way he carried himself on the football field. In 2008, he was behaving so good. When he saw the judge, they offered him to go to a lesser security, I guess you'd say, prison. And he declined it because he didn't think that'd be good for him. He stated that he had a routine and it was working, so why would I fix what's not broke? So he stayed at a higher security prison just due to he didn't think it'd be good for his character development. Think about that. And although he was sentenced to seven and a half years in jail, he got out after three years and 11 months. And this goes back to show how aware he is with who he is as a person. He stated when he got out of jail, it was scary because he had no sense of direction. Remember, when he's playing football throughout his life, didn't get in trouble. Why? He had a routine. They take football away from him, that's when he got in trouble because no routine. He goes to jail, develops a routine there, so there's nothing to worry about. But he knew, and this is how much he matured, once he got out of jail, that routine's gonna be gone because no more jail and no more football. So what's he gonna do? I don't think any of you are gonna believe what I'm about to say next. It, there's no way you're going to expect this. Maurice Claret, he re-enrolled back at Ohio State and took two classes, and he aced them both. And according to Maurice himself, he had fun learning and he enjoyed it. After that, he became a motivational speaker, live speaker, and also he started hosting some football camps. A lot of times he would speak to people in jail just trying to offer them some more encouragement and advice. And him and Jim Tressel did wind up reconnecting and even till this day, as when I'm speaking, they're good friends and they hang out. In 2016, Maurice founded the Red Zone, which is a behavioral health agency in Youngstown, Ohio, which provides mental health services. Shortly after that in 2021, Maurice was working as a consultant to college players players and more importantly college players associated with the University of Connecticut. A year after that in 2022 Maurice was appointed as a member of the Youngstown slash Warren Regional Chamber of Commerce. And as to where it stands if you're wondering where he's at till this day well why don't you find out for yourself because he loves posting on social media like Instagram and Twitter. This guy posts dang near every single day on Instagram. He has over, I'll show it to you right here, 3,700 posts. Super active guy on social media, which kind of shocked me because a lot of times guys that we do story videos on from 15, 20 years ago, they're not active on social media or they don't even have it. Why don't you take a look at this? This brought a smile to my face. Jim Tressel and Maurice Claret reunited. This story had so many ups and downs, but the way it turned down at the end, I can't tell you enough to Maurice Claret how proud I am of you and 
I'm wishing the best of luck, man, and I hope you continue to see a lot of success and you succeed in anything you choose to do moving forward. I don't think a lot of people quite understand how hard it is in this life to go from being at the top to being at the bottom and getting back up to where you're a winner in my book because that's what winning's about, bouncing back. I'm so happy for Maurice, such an admirable story, and let me know in the comment section, what do you think about all this and what do you think about what happened at Ohio State? Here's my final take on it. I think Ohio State, they did them dirty and they screwed them over. That's my opinion. Now, with that being said, don't get it twisted. Did Maurice make some terrible choices all along the way? Yes, he did. But I continue to go back to this as I was doing my research and gathering information for this video. All of those terrible choices and decisions he made, it happened after what Ohio State did to him. And we don't know if it would have turned out this way, but I don't think Maurice would have went down the path he did if he would have been able to continue to play college football for Ohio State and then go to the NFL. And maybe it would have turned out the same way. Maybe he would have turned into a raging alcoholic and went to all these parties and just had a miserable NFL stint or stint in the NFL, my apologies, but we never know. The way I view it was Claret felt like everybody turned on him and the only thing he could turn to to make himself feel better was doing those drugs and going to parties and etc. And by default, what that led up to is him being an alcoholic. I have a lot of sympathy for Maurice, I do, and it's crazy the thing about the butterfly effect here. None of this would have happened if the NIL would have been into effect back then. Think about that. All of this was stemming from him getting a couple of improper benefits and a couple thousand dollars. Crazy, man, it's crazy. Let me know your thoughts down below. But, uh,